Good evening, everyone. If you are joining us uh, from whatever forum or platform you're on, can I just welcome you to our evening service? Uh, we will be commencing back full services on the 11th of October, so can I just remind you of that? Uh, for those of you who don't perhaps know me, I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Ian, um, and we're going to be looking at God's Word from Joshua chapter 8 this evening. So whether you have a iPad or whether you have a phone or whether you have a Bible, can I encourage you to open that and can I encourage you to keep that open as we go through the text. I'm not going to be going back to the text once I've read it because there are just too many verses in the text to keep referring back to it, um, but we will be looking at what comes out of this particular chapter. So Joshua chapter 8, won't you join with me as we begin reading from that chapter. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You are to set an ambush behind the city. Don't go very far from it. All of you, be on alert. I and all those with me will advance on the city, and when the men come out against us, as they did before, we will flee from them. They will pursue us until we have lured them away from the city, for they will say, they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from the ambush and take the city. Yahweh, your God, will give it into your hands. When you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what Yahweh has commanded. See to it. You have my orders. Then Joshua sent them off, and they went to the place of ambush and lay in wait between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night with the people. Early the next morning, Joshua mustered his men, and he and the leaders of Israel marched before them to Ai. The entire force that was with him marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. They set up camp north of Ai, with the valley between them and the city. Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. They had the soldiers take up their positions, all those in the camp to the north of the city, and the ambush went to the west of it. That night, Joshua went into the valley. When the king of Ai saw this, he and all the men of the city hurried out early in the morning to meet Israel in battle at a certain place, overlooking the Araba. But he did not know that an ambush had been set against him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel let themselves be driven back before them, and they fled toward the desert. All the men of Ai were called to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were lured away from the city. Not a man remained in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. They left the city open and went in pursuit of Israel. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Hold out toward Ai the javelin that is in your hand, for into your hand I will deliver the city. So Joshua held out his javelin toward Ai. As soon as he did this, the men in the ambush rose quickly from their position and rushed forward. They entered the city, captured it, and quickly set it on fire. The men of Ai looked back and saw the smoke of the city rising against the sky, but they had no chance to escape in any direction, for the Israelites who had been fleeing toward the desert had turned back against their pursuers. 
For when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and the smoke was going up from the city, they turned around and attacked the men of Ai. The men of the ambush came out of the city against them so that they were caught in the middle with the Israelites on both sides. Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives. But they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing all the men of Ai in the fields and in the desert where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killed those who were in it. 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back his hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all that lived in Ai. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and the plunder of the city as Yahweh had instructed Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins, a desolate place to this day. He hung the king of Ai on a tree and left him there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered uh, them to take his body from the tree and throw it down at the entrance of the city gate. And they raised a large pile of rocks over it, which remains to this day. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to Yahweh, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Yahweh burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There, in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua copied on the stones the law of Moses, which he had written. All Israel, aliens and citizens alike, with their elders, officials and judges, were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, facing those who carried it, the priests who were Levites. Half the people stood in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had formerly commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curses, just as it is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women, children, and the aliens who lived among them. This is God's word. Won't you join with me? as we pray and ask for God's help in understanding it. Our Father, we are so grateful that you have given us your word. We are so privileged. When we think of the Israelites and the fact that they only had what had been written up until that point, and we have so much more, we stand in such a privileged position. And we thank you that your word gives us instruction on how to live It reveals to us who you are, where we come from, where we are going, what our purpose is in this world. We thank you that as we read your word, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and gives us understanding and insight that we cannot simply gain on our own strength. So I pray that for all who are watching this evening, that you would indeed take your word, open it up to them, give them insight, give them understanding. And take your word and drive it deep within the depths of their soul. That as they hear your voice to them, they would be forever changed. And I pray that you would help me, the preacher. I'm dependent upon you, Lord. You know that. I know that. Everyone else knows that. And may your spirit be pleased to take a weak vessel like myself and use me for your glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen. During the Welsh revival, a man was converted who had been a notorious drunkard. 
His conversion made him sober and respectable. The publician was angry to lose such a good customer and called out to him one day as he passed the bar. What's gone wrong, Charlie? Why do you keep going past instead of coming in? Charlie halted for a moment. Then with a scarred glance and a grateful tear glistening in his eye, replied, Sir, it is not just that I keep going past. We go past. Ah, yes, that is the secret. We go past, Jesus and I. Faith unites me to the living Christ so that his life flows to me and I can sing moment by moment I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I've life from above. There was a man who had been transformed by God and understood that the drinking habits he previously engaged in now had to change. His whole life changed. And now, instead of living in disobedience to God, he lived in obedience to God. He had repented, turned away from his sin. He was moving in a direction that was different to previously. So that when he gets to the bar that he would frequent prior to his conversion, where he would get drunk and drink with his mates, he knew that he could no longer go in there. The temptation was too great. It would have not been consistent with his faith. It would have been living in disobedience to God. And so he walked past that bar, recognizing that he and Jesus were walking past because Jesus is in him. And he understood the necessity of obedience, for God had given him a total victory over sin. It was a total rout over sin. Jesus had defeated the sin in his life. And now that he lived in the victory that Jesus brought, it meant living in obedience to God's command. When we look at this particular chapter in Joshua, it is about a nation that has repented, a nation that has turned away from their sin, a nation that has turned back to God. The sin that caused such disaster in their lives and brought such pain and suffering and caused the loss of life has now been dealt with. It's been exposed. It's been confessed. The necessary action has been taken. And now, as a result of that, God begins to move in the midst of them again and begins to presence himself with him and begins to reveal once again to them what his plans and purposes are for them. And I wonder, dear Christian, as you hear these words this evening, if that maybe describes your particular plight. Perhaps you are in that situation where You have been living in disobedience to God. And as you listen to the word that came last week from Pastor Nathan, that sin came to the surface. and You confronted that sin. And you recognized your need to repent and turn away from that sin. And now that you've engaged in that kind of action, and if you haven't, can I encourage you, listen to the sermon, that you might confront whatever it is that is perhaps between you and the Lord. But those of you who have, can I encourage you now that as you seek to live in obedience with God, that you commit yourself, as Israel will do at the end of this battle, to live in submission and obedience to God so that the victory that Christ has won on your behalf on the cross is the victory that you experience in your daily life as you seek to live out in a way that is pleasing to God. Come with me as we look at how this plays out in this account with Joshua. Firstly, I want you to notice the need for encouragement, verses 1 and 2. I will read those verses since it's only two verses. The need for encouragement. Listen to how God encourages Joshua. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. 
You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. Notice how God understands that at this juncture in the life of Joshua and in the life of Israel, they need some encouragement. Now you can imagine the scenario. Here is a nation that has gone in battle against Ai, has been defeated by Ai, has been routed by them. And now they have to retake that city that they were unable to take. They've got to go back there and they've got to form up in battle lines again. Now that the sin has been brought to the surface, now that they have confessed what it is that has caused God's judgment to stand against them, they're now in a position to go up and attack Ai. And so Yahweh wants to encourage Joshua. He wants to get alongside him. And he wants to say to Joshua, this time it's going to be different. This time I am going to go with you. This time I I am going to fight on your behalf. He wants Joshua to know with unmistakable certainty that when he goes and leads this nation into battle, it is not dependent on Joshua's ingenuity, Joshua's planning, Joshua's military strategy, but this is now going to be a victory that God will orchestrate. And so he encourages Joshua and he says, don't be discouraged. Don't allow the past to cause you to no longer want to move forward in the present and into the future. Is that not sometimes the word that you and I need as believers? Sometimes we go back to those past sins that we have dealt with before God. We've raised them, we've confessed them, we've turned away from them. And yet somehow it's as if we don't believe that God's forgiveness is complete. It's as if we need to reconfess, revisit them. And God, in a sense, comes alongside us and encourages us and says, leave the past in the past. We're done with that right now. Or maybe it is that the failures of the past haunt us, thinking that, is there any chance of me being successful in this in the future? I know I failed you, Lord, in this area of my life, and it's happened more than once. Is there any hope for me to get this right? Is there any hope for me to bring this under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And God comes alongside you and encourages you and says, yes, there is hope. If you rely on me, if you depend on me, if you draw on my strength, then yes, I can help you to continue moving forward. And you don't have to worry about those past failures that perhaps create fear in you to want to move forward or make you reluctant to want to move forward. And so God knows when we need encouragement and he comes alongside and helps us. Unlike the previous time, this time God reveals to Joshua his plans. In the previous chapter, you will notice Israel just go up against Ai. There's nothing of God in that whole episode. And while the main point of the previous chapter undoubtedly is the sin of Achan and the sin of taking the devoted things, and that is the main point, also in that chapter is very subtly, in a very subtle way, saying Israel should have consulted God. Israel should have followed God's leading. There was nothing of that. This time, as Yahweh meets with Joshua, there is clear instruction from him. Now the battle plans are given by Yahweh to Joshua because God is in it this time, unlike the last time. And if they're going to be fruitful in victory, then it is by God's strength that the fruitfulness will come. You see, Joshua continually needs to be reminded, as do you and I, that the victory we experience in our Christian lives is not a victory that is dependent upon how much strength you and I can generate. It's not dependent upon the strength of our temperament, not dependent upon the willfulness and the strength of our minds and how strong we are able to commit to certain things. But no, 
our ability to live in the victory of Jesus Christ on that cross is always dependent upon the strength of Yahweh. It is he who enables us to move forward. And it's not that God has left us to battle by ourselves. Like with Joshua, he says the victory is assured because he is on Joshua's side, he is on Israel's side, and he will effect the victory that is needed. Now for the Christian it is no different, is it not? We are reminded as Paul writes to the Ephesians, and let me read these verses for you. Verse 16 through to 17a. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that God strengthens us and the power, he uses two out of the three possible words he can use for power in the Greek language to tell us that we receive supernatural power from God in order to equip us and enable us to live a life that is ultimately pleasing to God. Or the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now hear that very carefully. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Paul is writing in the context of saying, I know what it's like to be blessed with a lot. I know what it's like to have nothing. I've experienced both sides of the equation. Yet in all of these circumstances, in plenty, in lack, my strength comes from Jesus. So can I say to you, Christian, as you look ahead and as you consider those areas of weakness in your life, those areas of failure, draw on the supernatural power of Jesus who dwells in you by the Spirit and is able to equip you and empower you to do what you cannot do on your own strength and enables you to do what you will fail to do if you only rely upon yourself. Notice too, he challenges, uh, he, he encourages Joshua by giving him the plans of how to defeat Ai. So he comes to Joshua and he says, right, this is how the battle is going to proceed. And so when you read from verses three onwards of the battle that rages and the preparations of the battle, Preparations 3 to 13 and the battle from 14 to 29. What you will discover is that at every point along the way, the instructions that are given to Israel by Joshua are instructions ultimately he has received from the Lord. So that's why he insists, do everything that has, I have commanded you to do. Why? Because it's come from God and God has given him the way in which they're going to defeat uh, the, the uh, Aites. And so it's important for Joshua to receive the plans from God that he might know that success now is absolutely guaranteed because it's not him deciding how this is going to work its way out, but it's God who's given him the plan. So the emphasis here is on Yahweh and is on Yahweh's ability to implement the right strategy in achieving this victory. It also ensures that when it comes to this victory, there will be no boasting. How can Joshua boast about a victory when in fact all of it is orchestrated by God? And it's a reminder to Joshua to be encouraged to know that victory will happen Because it's God's battle. Now, dear Christian, can I encourage you to realize that when you battle with sin, as all of us do, and when you struggle with temptation, that you need to remember that God battles on your behalf and God is able to help you to resist the temptations that come your way. And God encourages you and gets alongside you and reminds you that you do not face these things alone. You have on your side, fighting on your behalf, empowering you, the God of all glory. 
There is no difficulty, no challenge, no temptation that you face without having God walking with you and encouraging you and calling you to look to him. It's a wonderful story told. We all need encouragement. There's a wonderful story that uh, relates of uh, Wilberforce and Wesley. Uh, Those of you uh, who know something about William Wilberforce will know that he pushed Britain's parliament to abolish slavery. At one point in this battle, he was discouraged and was about to give up. His elderly friend, John Wesley, heard of it and from his deathbed called for a pen and paper. With a trembling hand, Wesley wrote, Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God, in the power of his might, till even American slavery shall vanish away before it. Wesley died six days later. But Wilberforce fought for 45 more years. And in 1833, three days before his own death, he saw slavery abolished from Britain. Hear those words. You have God on your side. Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 8 verse 31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? You have the resources that God provides for you. You have the king of kings. You have the ultimate warrior on your side. So whether it's a particularly difficult temptation that you're grappling with, whether it's a challenge that you're facing in life that is particularly difficult for you, know this, that God comes alongside you and says, I'm with you. Look to me. Be strengthened by me. Secondly, I want you to notice the necessity of obedience. Verses 3 to 29. We won't read those verses. There's too many verses. The necessity of obedience. Now what you see in this particular account is you see Israel obeying all the instructions to the letter. There is no deviation to the right or to the left. So that when Moses says to the force, I want some of you to go and lay an ambush and some of you to stay with me and we will make a frontal attack. And wait for my signal, wait for my command. And when we, we begin, we will follow the plan that Yahweh has given me to the nth degree. And then even at the end of that, when it comes to the slaughtering of the city, when it comes to the burning of the city, when it comes to the killing of all the people, they follow what God has commanded them. Now, I know there's a bit of discrepancy here between uh, verse 3 and verse 12, where you say there's one 5,000 force going off to lay an ambush, and then in uh, verse, uh, that, that's in verse 12, and in verse uh, 3, it talks about a, a 30,000 force. How do we reconcile these differences? Well, you will notice that somewhere through the text, uh, verses 3 to 9, that Bethel joined in the battle. And so what probably is going on here is that Joshua dispatches two forces of ambush, a force of 5,000 and then another force of 30,000. And these forces are west of Ai, between Bethel and Ai. One force would put to death the city and burn it, and the other force would uh, help with the, uh, those uh, soldiers who came out from Bethel and wanted to join Ai in the attack against Israel. So they're two separate forces that are lying in ambush. They go there the night before and lie in wait. The rest of the army is with Joshua and will make a frontal attack on Ai. Now you can imagine the scenario. The Aites come out of the city, they engage in the battle, and this is deja vu because Israel is turning around and they're in retreat. And so the Aites begin to pursue them along with those who have come out from Bethel, and they begin to pursue Israel, and it looks as though the battle is exactly as was before, deja vu. They're winning, they're going to defeat Israel, when suddenly... Joshua stops 
and he raises his javelin. And there must have been people who communicated that to those lying in ambush. And as he raises that javelin, so those lying in ambush rise up and attack the city from behind and attack the soldiers from behind. So now you have these soldiers from Ai and Bethel trapped between two forces. Those who were retreating turn around and begin to now engage in the battle. There's nowhere to run. They are trapped. They're doomed. They're done for. What I want you to see, though, and what I want you to understand is the reason that victory is so, uh, so g- given to Israel, rather, and, and so amazing is because there is obedience to God from start to finish. And as a result of their obedience, the blessing of God has rained down upon them. After all, God has already said in Deuteronomy that if Israel obey him and live in covenant with him and follow his commands and follow his word and follow his will, then he will bless them. If they turn against him, he will curse them. They've experienced the curse of losing lives in Joshua chapter 7. They are now experiencing the blessing of God because they are living and working in obedience with God when it comes to this invasion of AI. The judgment that God brings against this city is a culmination of his judgment over many, many generations so that all the people are slaughtered. And again, what we need to see in that is not the harshness, or sometimes our modern sensibilities want to see that as harsh. But what we need to see is this is judgment that has been withheld generation after generation after generation till eventually God in his patience says, enough, and the city is slaughtered. But ultimately, the judgment is pointing forward to a much more severe judgment. One of the commentators, now some of you will remember who have been at the church for a while that David Firth used to attend this church. His parents, Jeff and Denise Firth, now attend the church. David is an Old Testament scholar in England, a professor, and he uh, has written a commentary. And this is what he has written in his commentary regarding this chapter. In Yahweh's war against sin, it is those who resist his purposes who are destroyed, just as will happen in the final judgment. Now listen to the word of God. I want to read some verses because, you know, this is something that is easy to gloss over and it's easy for us just to, because of our modern sensibility, say, well, we don't want to hear about judgment. We don't like talking about the subject. It's not a very pleasant subject to have over dinner or to sit watching on TV, but it's a The reality that we must face up to, we must confront. Romans 14 verse 12 says, uh, God says, So then, each of us will give account of himself to God. And then in Revelation chapter 20 verse 12 to verse 15, hear this. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was a judge according to what he has done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now hear what God is saying. It's very important. He's telling us that once we die, that's the first death in this world, there is a day in eternity where God will raise from the dead Every single person who has ever lived and every single person will stand before the judgment throne of God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he will open the books and everything that we have done has been recorded in those books and we will stand and give an answer to him. 
and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, those who have not repented of their sin, those who have not turned away from their sin, those who have not accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, they will, along with death, be cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. And the second death means that for all those who do not have a relationship with Christ, they will suffer the eternal wrath of God being exercised them as they are in that lake of fire. I know it's not a pleasant subject, but you need to hear that because at the end of the day, I would be a very, very dishonest preacher if I didn't warn you of the reality of the judgment to come. This judgment on that city, Ai and Bethel, is simply pointing forward to a much more significant judgment, the eternal judgment of God. And so while you still have opportunity in this world, while you still draw breath, can I urge you, can I plead with you, Don't reject the offer of grace from Jesus Christ. He has come into this world that you might have life, that your name may be written in the Lamb's book of life with the blood of Jesus. Don't allow your stubbornness, don't allow your rebellion to cause you to miss out and to experience the second death for all eternity. Coupled to the judgment, as I've been trying to emphasize, is the necessity of obedience. The city, Ai, has obviously turned away from God. Israel has experienced what it's like to experience the wrath of God when they disobeyed God. Now they've obeyed him and they experience his blessing. Obedience is the fruit, is the overflow of a relationship with Jesus. You cannot claim to know Christ without there being obedience in your life. It's impossible. Obedience is the outworking of our relationship with Christ. In fact, Jesus says in John 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And if you love me, you will obey me and remain in my love. So that those who claim to be in a relationship with Jesus, who claim to love him, who claim to know him, must then show some kind of evidence of that love through their obedience. You can't not be obedient to Christ and claim to be a Christian. Now that doesn't mean obedience to Christ is perfect. We are not going to perfectly obey him, but there is at least a consistency to obedience and there is a desire to want to obey him and there is a a wanting to please him and live in a way that reflects God's commands and God's will. Listen to John. John writes in 1 John 5 verse 2. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Now, listen. This is love for God, to obey his commands. I don't know, you can't get it clearer than that, can you? And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Why do those who are born of God overcome the world? In other words, overcome the sinful world in which they live. Well, he tells us. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It is through our faith. Why through our faith? What does our faith do that enables us to experience that victory? He tells us. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, it's a way of saying that in order to overcome the world, you need to be in a relationship with Christ because Jesus has defeated sin on the cross. He has overcome Satan. He has overcome the world. 
And we, through faith, participate in that victory. We enjoy the victory of Christ. And as we enjoy that victory of Christ, and as we participate in it, the natural outflow of that victory is obedience to God. So you must show some evidence of obedience if you are claiming to know Jesus and have a relationship with him. If obedience is absent, if you don't love God's commands, if there is an antipathy towards God's commands, if you find God's commands hard and burdensome and you hate having to obey them and it becomes a duty and you're not doing it out of love, there's something wrong. If you're going to experience fruitful Christian lives, you also need to live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience is what enables us to enjoy the, the, the presence of God and enables us to experience the blessing of God upon us, even if the blessing is simply His smile upon us. Don't interpret blessing necessarily as material blessing. But see God's blessing upon us as God being pleased with all that we do and enabling us to enjoy a fruitful, meaningful, purposeful Christian walk and Christian life. Obedience is something that ought to be part and parcel of who we are. There's a wonderful story that is told about some Arabian horses and how they're trained. Uh, Arabian horses go through very rigorous training in the Middle East. The trainers require absolute obedience from the horses. And to test them to see if they are completely trained, the final test is almost beyond endurance of any living thing. The trainers force the horses to do without water for many days. Then he turns them loose and of course they start running toward the water. But just as they get to the edge, ready to plunge in and drink, the trainer blows a whistle. They turn around and they come back, pacing back to the trainer. They stand there quivering, wanting water, but they wait in perfect obedience. When the trainer is sure that he has, has their obedience, he gives them the single signal to go back and drink. Now, this may seem severe, but when you are on the trackless desert of Arabia and your life is entrusted to a horse, you had better have a trained, obedient horse. Now, if horses learn obedience like that to their trainer, how much more should you and I, as God's children, learn to obey him, learn to follow his paths? Learn to be committed to doing that which is right, that which is revealed in his word. How is it with you and God and your obedience to him, Christian? Is this an area of great embarrassment to him? Is your life more characterized by disobedience? Do you and God get into lots of arguments about his word and what he wants you to do? Do you constantly fight against him? Are you constantly questioning him and saying, Lord, why do I have to do this? Why should I have to love my brothers and sisters? Look what they've done to me. Look how hard they've been to me. Look how they've hurt me. Why do I have to love them? Lord, why do I have to resist temptation? Am I missing out on this particular thing that you say that I ought not to enter into? Lord, why is this obedience so hard? Lord, you, 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 you give me commands, for example, and I've mentioned this previously, where God's word says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Lord, there's this guy, there's this girl that I, I really want to date and they're not a Christian. Lord, why can't I date them? Why can't I just do what I want to do? Christian, if you love Jesus, then obedience to him is paramount. And that becomes your first priority. And your desires will be submitted to him, and obedience will be forthcoming. And if you resist that obedience, perhaps your love for him is where the problem lies. 
Thirdly, I want you to notice the necessity of renewal. Why is this so important? Verses 30 to 35. Very quickly, why is this so important? Well, the Israelites have disobeyed God in Joshua chapter 7. This episode has come to an end. And so there needs to be a renewal of the covenant. They need to again reaffirm their commitment to obedience to all that God has revealed. So Moses, uh, rather Joshua, sets up an altar. Now it's significant where he sets up this altar, Mount Ebal. This is being set up according to the command of Moses. Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 27 verses 4 and 5 said to the Israelites, when they enter into the land and they cross over the Jordan, they must set up an altar to the Lord at Mount Ebal. And so this is that altar that is now being set up. So again, there is an obedience issue here that is at stake. But it's not just an obedience issue. It is wanting to remind themselves that they need to commit themselves to submitting to all that God has revealed in the law to Moses, and hence Joshua rereads it out. But what I also want you to see here is the altar is built in a specific way. No uncut stones, no, no stones that have been cut, so it's uncut stones that are put on the altar. No tools must be used. And when the priest w- walks up the steps of the altar, they must have robes on so that their nakedness underneath would not be exposed because God has ethical demands. And when we come to worship God, We don't just rock up and do it the way that we want to do it. We do it the way that God has revealed that we ought to do it. We follow God's word. Worship is not just a haphazard affair of everyone doing their own thing and for us simply to decide what we think is is going to be good and not good and and simply pandering to the, the wants of people. No, no, no. Worship must always be in consistency with the principles that God has given us in his word. And so Paul, when he writes to the Corinthian church in chapters 12, 13, and 14, deals with this disorderliness that's going on. And particularly chapter 14, when he gets to chapter 14, he says it's chaotic. You guys are just doing what you want, and there's chaos going on. And if an unbeliever walks in there, they're going to look at this uh, stuff that's going on in your worship service and they're going to turn around and they're going to walk out because they're going to say, this is just too weird. No, and so he concludes in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, I want to read this to you, and he says, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. God has not changed. We don't just determine what we're going to do, but we follow the word that God has given to us and we make sure that our worship conforms to his word. It's very important that we remain Bible-centered in our worship, and that means being Christ-centered in our worship. And it means that the authority of God's word has the last word. It's not about my opinion. It's not about your opinion. It's about God's revealed word. And uh, Joshua understands that, and so the altar is built according to God's word. They then offer sacrifices. There's a burnt offering because that offering is atoning for sin. And then there's also the fellowship offering, reminding them of their communion and their fellowship with God. And significantly also with that altar uh, is the proclamation and submission to the covenant claims of God that is symbolized by that very sacrifice and the building of that altar. So here the people are re-pledging themselves to the covenant, re-pledging themselves to God, saying, yes, Lord, we will obey you. We will follow you. We understand that if we follow you, you will bless us. If we don't follow you, you will curse us. And it's a reaffirmation of that. Thus, do you see that after the sacrifice has been offered, Joshua stands up and he reads the law because the people know and need to be reminded of what is in the law, which is why, do you see, when Paul writes uh, to, to Timothy, he says to him, do not neglect the public reading of Scripture because you and I as God's people, 
need constantly to be reminded of God's word. It needs to be read and reread and read and reread because we are prone to forget. We are prone to wonder. And so the very vital need of having God's word as part of any worship that we engage in in a church is absolutely fundamental to what we do as God's people. And the preaching of God's word is fundamental to that because the preaching of God's word is a reminder to us of what God's word says. And we need to be reminded continually Here the people once again pledge themselves to Yahweh. And perhaps, my dear friend, there's someone who is in that same situation. You've strayed from God like Israel did in Joshua chapter 7. You've walked away. You've disobeyed. You've done things you're not proud of. Your life is a little bit of a mess right now. And you recognize the need to bring your life and put it back on the altar. For we are, as Paul says to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 1, living sacrifices. And perhaps you've taken yourself off the altar, and perhaps you've broken some vows to God. And God is gently encouraging you and reaching out to you and saying, come back, come back, my child. Reaffirm those vows to me. Recommit yourself to me. Resubmit your life to me. Bow before me. Put yourself back on the altar. And allow me to be the one who directs you. Submit your mind, your physical body, your will to me. And allow me to direct you. Perhaps you've torn down those spiritual altars in your life. Your quiet time's gone out the window. You're hardly reading scripture. Your prayer life is a mess. Perhaps it is that your Christian witness is an absolute ruin. Can I encourage you? God waits with you with outstretched arms and says, come back, my child. Come, let us reason together. Let your sins be washed so that they may be as white as snow. Come back, my child. Let us walk together in communion once again. Will you come? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to embrace it, help us to live it, help us to be obedient to it. And for those, Lord Jesus, whose lives are in a bit of a mess right now. You know who they are. They can hide it from me. They can hide it from the other pastors. They can hide it from other church members. They can't hide it from you. I pray that you would bring them to the foot of the cross. Enable them to once again offer themselves to you to re-surrender their lives, to renew their commitment. For Jesus' sake. Amen. May the Lord bless you.